Uh, what's that, Holmes? Oh, I hope you mean more coffee. You want me to pour you some also? Or would you like more bacon? <laughs> no, Watson. I was not referring to the breakfast or the coffee. You will not, I'm sure, be offended in any way if I say that I find your acceptance of the ordinary always refreshing. I don't think I understand, Holmes. I, I, I'm not aware that I've done anything unusual. I've barely spoken to you since I came to the table. Exactly. Yet you told me a great deal. You will always accept things on their face value. I happen to see quite a bit deeper than that. That's why I say you should do it. You should accept the invitation from your old school to contribute to their field bazaar. Now, am I not right? present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, the Field Bazaar. In the early days of my association with Sherlock Holmes, I have to admit that I found him rather overbearing. In later years, I grew used to his manner, and after I'd married Mary and moved away from 221B Baker Street, I was able to laugh at my feelings of inferiority. But he was never an easy man to understand, and I well remember during the summer of 1885 being particularly disconcerted by his attitude. It was one of those lovely, long, hot English summers. Days which cried out to be spent in the country. Walks along narrow, leafy lanes filled with the drone of bees and the smell of honeysuckle. That's why, when our letter arrived on that August morning, I was very tempted. And Holmes knew this. I repeat, I should say yes. Holmes, I really don't know what you're talking about. I've just told you. You've been asked to help in the Oxley Field Bazaar. Haven't you? Yes, that's correct, but I cannot for the life of me see how you know this. The letter has only just come to hand, and I've not spoken to you since I opened it. In spite of that, I would even venture to suggest the purpose of the bazaar. It's to gain funds in order to enlarge the school's cricket field. Holmes, there are times when I think you use some form of black magic. <laughs> you really are a most excellent companion, Watson. You respond instantly to all my mental processes. Really, I can find you easier to read each morning than I do the daily newspapers. I'm sorry. I, I'm so transparent. I, I don't think it's unintelligent to be puzzled by your knowledge. But if you're so clever, perhaps you'll tell me how you've arrived at your conclusion. I really claim no credit. The facts are so obvious. You came into breakfast with a thoughtful expression. The expression of a man who is debating some point in his mind. In your hand, you held a solitary letter. Now, last night, you retired in the best of spirits. So it was clear that it was in this letter which caused the change in you. Yes, well, that's obvious. Well, anything is obvious once it's explained. I naturally asked myself what the letter could contain which might have this effect upon you. As you came and sat down, you had the flap side of the envelope towards me. There is a crest upon it, the Oxley crest. The same shield-shaped device which is on your old cricket cap. Then you poured yourself a cup of coffee and walked over to the mantelpiece. Yes, well, that's very observant. And then? You gazed for some time at the group photograph of yourself in the cricket team. Clearly, you were remembering many occasions of being in that side. You came back down, helped yourself to eggs and bacon, and again read the letter. This time the envelope was face side up. I could see that it was informally addressed, just to John Watson, Esquire. So it must have been something of a friendly and informal nature. Now, there are three institutions that are almost always debt-laden. The country churches the old people's homes and the cricket clubs. Your interest was certainly in the cricket club. Uh, well, quite correct. Well, the best fundraising idea is a form of a bazaar. It's a very popular activity among public schools at the moment. Hence my suggestion that you should take part in it. Now, what is it to be? An old boys' cricket match on Oxley Common? Or will you use the school facilities? <laughs> All right, Holmes, all right, you win. Your deductions are correct as usual. Splendid. 
Now tell me, are you accepting? Yes, I will. On one condition. Oh, what's that? That you accompany me. Our old boy's side may be a man or two short, and you're a good bat as well as a rather crafty slow bowler. What do you say, Holmes? The weather's ideal. We stay Friday and Saturday nights at the Boar's Head and Oxley Common, get back here on Sunday evening. Very welcome break in the country. Now, come on, do say yes. To my surprise, Sherlock Holmes agreed immediately. I wrote off to Oxley School, accepting the invitation and placing my name down for cricket. I also mentioned that Holmes, while not an old boy, was prepared to help out as extra man should he be needed. The weather continued to hold good, and Friday saw us down at Oxley in good time. I'd been the war's head since I was a student, and I was happy to find that it still maintained its excellent standards. That evening, the bar was crowded with visitors, all with one subject in mind. The next day's cricket match. No, oh, I say, I say. It's Watson, isn't it? John Watson. That's right. By uh, Joe, don't tell me, Rufus. Matthew Rufus. Well, I, I haven't seen you in over 20 years. Uh, must be every bit of that. I take it you were down here for the match tomorrow. That's right. Thought I'd like to support the old school, you know. Oh, uh, allow me to introduce you. This is Sherlock Holmes. How do you? Colonel Matthew Rufus. How do you do? How do you do? Um, have you studied the sides? A copy of the teams and batting order over there on the notice board. Yes, I did take a look at it earlier. It seemed very well balanced. Should be a good match. There hardly anyone I can remember on the list, though. Oh, most fellows have simply sent in a contribution. Bad show. I think it's much more cooperative to turn up and do one's bit, eh? There are a couple of the old stalwarts there, of course. Thackeray and Monkton. I was all for putting them in the same side, but the uh, committee thought it would unbalance the match. They're both fierce cricketers. <laughs> Playing together, their side would win hands down. <laughs> they always were rivals, even at college. Well, it got worse as the years have gone by. There's some talk about Thackeray making a pass at other men's lives. No, oh, I'm not surprised. He always was a dog for the ladies. And Munson's as jealous as blazes. Ungovernable temper. Well, uh, let's hope it doesn't find its way onto the pitch. Oh, it could well do. Uh, Munson is a bowler of tremendous speed. But uh, not all that careful. He's inclined to aim at the batsman more than the wicket. <laughs> oh, dangerous. Uh, Thackeray, on the other hand, is known to go all out to win, regardless of what happens. Yes, from what I recall, he's never been a popular man with the other side. He never takes a risk. Successful, but not really a sportsman. Plays to win. Doesn't care how it comes about. Yeah, that's right. He uses his pads too much. Never played in innings without two or three appeals for LBW. Rumor also has it that uh, he'd often tried to square the umpires in his favor. Yeah, doesn't sound a very good sort. Well, neither of them are, in my opinion. The captains will uh, just have to keep a tight rein, huh? Uh, oh, that's your captain over there in the corner having a quiet pint. Charles Ellis, local chemist. Oh, sound fellow. Uh, I'll take you across and introduce you, shall I? I met Ellis and a few other cricketers whom I didn't know. Holmes, never bored when there were interesting people around to study, puffed away at his Maersham pipe and listened avidly to the local gossip. Time went by, and then Ellis and the Colonel were joined by James Monkton. Well, Monkton, ready for the game tomorrow? You're ready for anything, Colonel. Anything that your side and that lout Thackeray can dish up. Oh, uh, come on now, Monkton. That's not the spirit you approach the game with. It's a social occasion, not a private war. Well, that's all very well, Ellis. You're Thackeray's captain, and it's your job to see he plays cricket in the proper manner. But as long as I've known him, he's been utterly selfish out there in the pitch. He thinks only of himself, getting runs and blocking with his pads. He holds up the game and drags it out, just stonewalling until the spectators groan with boredom. I hope you'll give him some firm instructions not to apply those tactics tomorrow. Monkton, you know as well as I do that that's his style of play. But surely you can advise him to take a few chances. Go for some runs and give the crowd their money's worth. As you say, it's a social occasion. Let's give him something to clap for. I'm sure he'll do his best. <laughs> well, if he plays his usual game, it won't be good enough. I tell you, I'll give him a run for his money. 
I'll start that bad day stuff. And I'll pack my leg field and have him on the hop. Oh, no, look here, Munchen. That's no attitude. That's no attitude in which to approach the game. Now, this is cricket, not a bastard vendetta. No, and you've got to remember that Thackeray isn't as young as he was. You start bowling bouncers and aiming for his body, it could cause him an injury. Well, that's too bad. It's up to him. I heard all that, Munton. Didn't know I was at the bar just behind you, did you? Huh? No. Thackeray. Well, I don't care if you heard or not. In fact, it's just as well. Perhaps now your captain will give you some well-founded advice. I don't need any advice, not from Ellis or anyone else. I'm going to play my usual game. Just because you've never got the better of me, on the field or off, is no reason why I should change. It's a pity you can't change a lot of things. Your behaviour as a man is almost as bad as your cricket manners. Now, look here. If you really want to get personal, everyone knows you're not much of a man in lots of ways. Ask your wife. Why, you dirty nut. You think I got back around the Colonel Rufus, take oh. his men out of here. This be a respectable pub or gymnasium. Hear me? If you want to fight, get out on the lane. Now, come on, it's time anyway. Time, time, gentlemen, please. Clear from that very first evening that the Saturday match on Oxley Common was not going to be the quiet, relaxed game of village cricket that we'd all expected. Most of us, from Colonel Rufus and George Biggs the publican, down to the lowest farmer's boy, deplored the bad manners shown by both Monkton and Thackeray. Outside the boar's head in the warm night air, the two men were made to apologise to Biggs and were persuaded to shake hands. And then, in an atmosphere of uneasy truce, they said good night. Monkton went striding off down the main street, while Thackeray stood for a while arguing with Ellis, who was, no doubt, giving him a bit of a dressing down. The next morning saw the opening of the Field Bazaar by the Vicar of Oxley. And after luncheon, our side won the toss and Chelmsford and Howes went into bat. I noted that Monkton was not put on to bowl and wondered if they were saving him for when Thackeray went to the crease, which seemed rather a dangerous plan. However, whether by accident or design, that's exactly what happened. Chelmsford was caught in the slips at a score of 15, and in went Thackeray. He played his usual tight game, scoring quite a few runs, but taking no chances, and using his pads whenever possible. Then, when the total was 29, the opposing captain put Moncton on from the duck pond end. A murmur went round the spectators. Rumours spread quickly in country villages, and Oxley was no exception. Everyone knew of a row the night before. Gad! Those two are really at it. A bad show, eh, Holmes? Well, they're certainly not sinking their differences for the good of the game. Oh, dear. An appeal for LBW. Umpire has disallowed it there. Thackeray was very lucky there, if you ask me. Just the sort of thing to infuriate Munt. Yeah, afraid so. You start bowling straight at him to teach him a lesson. <laughs> Same old arguments. Just what we feared would happen, huh? Mm. Uh, here he comes again. Long run. Right up to the wicket. Gads! Uh, Gads! Ah, that must have hurt. Bounced right full up and caught Thackeray in the chest. No, oh, it was not cricket, sir. Intent to harm, all right. Definitely not cricket. Uh, Thackeray seems doubled up, but I... No, I think he's all right. He's not leaving the field, anyway. He's just rubbing his chest under the heart. Hitching his pants up now and patting the crease. Uh, Munchen in again. A fast one. And this time, Thackeray has got his own back. Well outside the stumps. And he stepped out and put his left pad to it. Oh, I can't blame him. Oh, Munchen is furious, of course. Going back now to run again. Takes a long run, this man. All that force, he needs it. But in he comes. But, but wait a minute. Thackeray's staggering. Something is happening out there. But Thackeray's stumping down. Great heavens, he... He, he's collapsed. He, he's fallen down on his face. Watson, that man is ill out there. Come on, get out to him. He's seriously ill. Come on, let's get out there where there's still time. Oh, 
Holmes and I left our seats in the pavilion and hurriedly followed by the colonel, we raced across the grass towards the cricket pitch. Game had stopped, of course, and a cluster of fielders gathered around the prostrate body of Thackeray. They made way for me automatically, and I knelt down beside him. One look was enough. The man was dead. What's the matter, Watson? You're a doctor. What's wrong with the man? I'm afraid he's dead, Colonel. Must have been that blow under the heart. Uh, we must get him back to the pavilion. Dead? All right, men. Lift him up. I mean, carefully now. Ellis? Yes. Please see that there's a, as little fuss as possible. Okay, okay. Carry him off the field. Oh, the match must, of course, be abandoned. And uh, I'm see that the police are informed. Uh, Mountain, uh, please find the village council. Police? What, what for? I, I mean, it must have been a heart attack. Why is it for the police? Well, there must be an examination. Must make it official. I have no doubt about Watson's verdict. But things must be done in the correct manner. Uh, give a hand there. Uh, give a hand and keep the people back for heaven's sake. Uh, Come yeah. along. Let's get some order into things. Yeah. Uh, come on. Thackeray's body was carried to the pavilion, and there a meeting extraordinary was held by the colonel. There was no panic. People were very concerned, but sympathetic and considerate. Sam Wiley, the local constable, was dispatched on his bicycle into Oxley for a carriage ambulance from the hospital. And shortly after that, Inspector Winters arrived. Well, there was really nothing much anyone could do. Just a regrettable accident. At least, so we all thought at that time. I looked around the pavilion and found Sherlock Holmes carefully removing the dead man's pads. Holmes. Holmes, what a tragic accident. And that's what it appears to be, doesn't it? But as I'm always saying to you, Watson, you will take things at their face value. Oh, now, careful with these pads. I imagine the inspector will be in here at any moment... Things must be left to him, of course, but if he needs my help, then I will willingly give it. I think that for the time being, it would be better not to interfere. Holmes, you can't mean that this was not an accident. Of course it wasn't. Uh, I see what you mean. Monkton's intention to harm Thackeray at all costs. Yes, it's a very tricky situation. Right, uh, oh. yes, it all Here they come now. Yes, Colonel, Monkton, yes. and the inspector. Uh, yes, well, we carried him in here, of course. We encouraged all the spectators to get back to the field bazaar. There's no sense in allowing this tragedy to ruin the whole of the charity. I understand, Colonel. I agree. But after the body is taken away, I'm afraid I shall have to go into things in rather more detail. For instance, Monkton, I shall have to ask you to come with me to the police station. <laughs> Whatever for? Well, uh, there will be an inquest. It's purely another formality, of course. I have no doubt it was heart failure. But heart failure caused by what? Everyone knows it was a blow to the heart by a cricket ball traveling at terrific speed. Now, now, wait a minute. I didn't kill Thackeray. I, I mean, it, it was an accident. I, I didn't deliberately kill him. I... Manslaughter is a very loose term, Monkton. There's a great deal of difference between manslaughter and murder... Manslaughter involves unplanned conditions and the like, accidents through negligence, but you are intent on causing bodily harm. There are dozens of witnesses prepared to testify to that. But, but, but that's ridiculous. Uh, an unlucky blow. Uh, was... Like a man who kills someone in a fight? Exactly. Sorry, the matter will have to be taken up. It simply can't be glossed over. Do you not agree, Colonel? Uh, well, uh, that's, uh, it's not for me to say. You're the law, but... Uh, well, uh, I'd seek advice from a solicitor as soon as you can, Monkton. Sound advice, Colonel. Come, man, you haven't been charged with anything yet? Let's get the body out of here. The carriage is waiting. Uh, bring him out this way. Oh, okay. right. oh, there there go. Go. That's it. Get the doors open, Peter. Uh, well, Colonel... Aren't you coming? No. No, and neither are you. We are both staying here. But, uh, Holmes, what do we do here? Very simple, Watson. Catch the murderer. Murderer? Quite. Thackeray didn't die of a heart attack. He was poisoned. What the... Holmes, you can't be serious. My dear Watson, have I ever joked about sudden death? You are a medical man, but you were just as taken in by the circumstances as anyone else. I examined the dead man and thought it looked more like poison than a heart attack, and I was right. Look, careful now. Study the dead man's pads. Here, let me show you. 
Now, you see, these pads are stiffened with cane struts, but here, here is another twisted thorn. That splinter of wood is impregnated with a deadly poison. The man died not directly after a blow under the heart, but immediately after a blow on the left knee. He stepped out, used his pad. The splinter tore into the flesh of his knee, and that's how he died. Then, then if what you say is correct... Whoever organized this dreadful crime must have known that Thackeray would be hit on the pads. The whole of Oxley knows that. Thackeray was bound sooner or later to risk putting a pad out to a fast ball in sheer defiance of Monkton's tactics. The fact that he received a blow the ball before was simply coincidence. And one which worked very nicely as far as the murderer was concerned. But uh, Holmes? And, uh, who could have done this, this terrible thing? And that's what we have to discover, isn't it? Look, the hue and cry has died down a little now. We shall have to be patient, I'm afraid. This pavilion is used not only as a dressing room for cricketers, but for storage as well. The cement roller, the gardener's equipment, everything used to keep the common clean and tidy. There are plenty of places where we can conceal ourselves. Somehow, I don't think we shall have long to wait. Yes, here, behind... Behind here. Yes, uh, that's it. Now... Thackeray's pads are clearly displayed there on the bench. Wait. Quickly, Watson, quickly. I think we're about to have a visit. Shh, 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 wait. Look there. The open doorway. Wait. Wait until he picks it up. And... Now, now, Watson, hold him. Hold yeah. him. Right. What the devil? How dare you? What do you think you're doing? All right. Call the colonel and the constable. It's all over, Ellis. As a cricket captain, you may be quite good, but as a killer, you're caught out in every sense of the word. Ellis was taken away by Constable and Colonel Rufus. Under interrogation, he broke down and confessed everything. It was a diabolically clever plan that he'd conceived and almost carried out. It was left to Holmes to fill in the details, as usual. You may have noticed when we first arrived down here that I was unusually quiet at the bar. I was listening to the local gossip. It wasn't all about Thackeray and Monkton and their cricketing rivalry. There was a deal of talk about Thackeray's amours with the local ladies. Everyone thought he was after Monkton's wife. But quite a few locals knew that it was Ellis's wife with whom he was carrying on an affair quite openly. Ellis, being the local chemist, had no difficulty in obtaining the Brazil curare poison. It fades from the bloodstream in a matter of hours and so would remain undetected. Oh, yes, it was very clever. But thanks to you being on the spot, Watson, he had no chance of examining the dead man and removing his pads straight away. I think we've made our contribution to justice and the field bazaar, don't you? Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson.